Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 655. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and today is March 30th, 2021. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. We're very happy to have you here. Um, just fair warning beforehand, if you hear somebody dropping a wrench or a ratcheting tool or some type of noise that sounds like it shouldn't really be part of the Unscripted program, that's because my RV tech is here. He's doing some stuff to the RV before we uh, uh, leave for our trip starting, I guess, the middle, late April. We're going to head back north. Um, but before that, you need your oil change. You need all the things fixed uh, so that you don't have breakdowns on the way. We don't want to break down on the way, George. Um, hey, George, I got my shot. I got the old uh, stage one COVID first shot uh, at uh, CBS. And so far, all I have is the, so the sore shoulder. Um, I know you got the shot last week. How did that go? Well, I had the Moderna shot, my wife and I, a uh, week ago Wednesday, and she too had a sore upper arm where they poked her. I went immediately afterward. I had no pain. I was perfectly fine. We went home. I fell asleep for eight hours in the middle of the day. And for two days, I was stuck in mud. I was a zombie. But by uh, Saturday morning, it was all passed. And either, either I had the worst hangover I have ever had in my life, or that shot knocked me off the earth for two days. Yeah, we had the Pfizer, and I guess if you go somewhere on the internet, there's the, the list of 35 possible side effects from the vaccines, and none are really bad. Um, I guess the worst one you could have is the allergy, which is a small percentile of people are allergic to the shot. Um, but in general, people have a malaise, a blah, a, sh a sore shoulder, and, you know, well, I don't two want... out of three of those things describe the Jimmy Carter administration. Yes, I know. So. It's a blah. <laughs> no, indeed. So, and we survived that, didn't we, George? Yes, we did. Okay. Uh, before we get on to the news, this is Easter week. This is Holy Week. And uh, we, are, we have George here on Boward, Boward Time because um, this is the busiest week I can think of for uh, uh, clergy, especially in the Anglican and uh, Roman Catholic and liturgical traditions. Technically, yes. Technically, it is the most busy liturgical week, but for most Episcopal clergy, the busiest week of the year is Master's Week, where we're all watching the Masters from Augusta, Georgia. But, Kevin, you are right, sort of. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. I'm, you're absolutely right. Uh, and this year, mo most clergy are doing double duty of having to do online and in-person services mm -hmm. because we still don't have 100% uh, of the people back in the pews and it's looking like we never will, uh, that uh, we've lost 20%. Uh, if it were only 20% as of this past Sunday, I'd be pleased. But in calling and talking, I think we're going to lose 20% to of our congregation to, to the internet, to uh, sloth, to, well, I haven't gone to church for a year, and, and I guess I'll wait till I start dying to call Father George. Well, I, I um, also say there's I, a, I, I don't a, want to be cynical, but... We're in a different world, Kevin. We, we are. And this is what I call the COVID freeze. People mm -hmm. don't want to re-engage anymore. They've been mm -hmm. stuck in their houses and their basements and their living rooms and inside these four walls, ordering food, ordering groceries, and they're not excited yet to re-engage, to have what people are calling the, the, the new 1920s here, the, the, the big economy explosion. They're, they're afraid because they've been, you know, just socially neglected uh, in any inter interactions outside of maybe some close family for a whole year. Why would they want to go to a bar mitzvah? Why would they want to go to a bit bridal shower? Why would they want to, you know, embrace these things where uh, they aren't just afraid of COVID, they're just afraid of social interaction? You're absolutely right. Um we at my church i have a staff meeting every monday morning i have two meetings i have a staff meeting where we go over the mechanical technical things and then a pastoral meeting with the deacons and the senior warden and it's almost like uh, case rounds where we go over the needs in the parish of individuals and 
we've been able to care for those people who have been in extremists or have had difficulties that we've been aware of. But as things start to thaw out a bit, we were flooded on Wednesday with information about people who in essence are afraid to leave their homes. They have almost have COVID syndrome, mm -hmm. not, the, not the virus, but they have been used to and been accu acculturated into being afraid of everybody and everything. Started off with the government and then the TV commercials. Uh, to this day, you turn on the TV and they have uh, people, they push the social distancing and the double masking and mm -hmm. children can't play with other children unless they're wearing a mask. And if you're an 80 year old woman who lives by herself and her cat and you're scared, that fear, I'm not a psychologist, but I think there are some syndromes that are developing of people who have been locked, who've been institutionalized by their own homes because of COVID. Yeah, we have friends who actually have uh, siblings and um, uh, other kids who are actually in foreign countries, Canada, uh, Europe, and stuff like that. And, you know, they just don't have the ability to travel and see them if they wanted to. If there was a mm -hmm. death in a family, they could not gather because of uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. And I think that just adds to the, the stress that's been going on. And now that we're reopening, there's, nobody's really jumping that. Now, hold on. The millennials and the Gen Zs are. But I think at a certain age, the 65 plus age, uh, unless you're in an RV park and you just can't wait to go north, uh, you're not exactly jumping out of your house. Yeah. Well, we have people moving in stages. There are people who, it's a big deal for them finally to go to the grocery store instead of having the groceries delivered. Mm -hmm. Or for the more active, they're finally going out to play golf because it's outdoors. But to go into a, built, a closed environment like a church for an hour and a half is a step too far for some people. And we have to be patient. We have to encourage them. But th there's some remarkable things going on in our community. Um, my, my senior warden, who's a wonderful woman, a retired psychologist, uh, has been praying for revival in our church and our community. And this past Sunday, I am a low church evangelical. I, I'm sure I'm shocking everybody by telling them that. You wear a collar. You're not that low. <laughs> well, I'm an American low church evangelical. Um, I'm not English. Far from it. Thanks be to God. Um, but on Sunday at the t but uh, on, at a recent Sunday service, I had people beginning to speak in tongues. You just don't do that in an Episcopal church. Thank you very much. It's the sort of the mindset. I um, mean, they were wearing their masks, and I thought they were swearing at me under their breath as I was preaching and praying. But and on last night, uh, Monday night, uh, sorry, Sunday night, we have our pet service, which was outdoors, and we sit in a large hold, hold semicircle. On. If you're about to tell me the dogs were speaking in tongues, then you know, no, the no, no, are. they weren't right. speaking in tongue. <laughs> but this was a a proper Episcopal dog service where okay. everyone was a purebred gold <laughs> retrievers Bichon Frise yes. my Cavalier King Charles uh, Spaniel somebody else's Cavalier King Charles Spaniel it was the Westminster dog show transported to a church in Florida so there are about 50 of us and about halfway the serve woman so this is the AA meeting and I said oh I'm sorry they meet on Monday nights but we're having a prayer meeting. Would you like to join us? And and uh, she said, "Oh, I guess so. I've got nowhere else to go." And she sat down, and we. It, it is our custom to pray for everybody in turn. And I sort of did her last because I didn't want to put her on the spot. Mm -hmm. And as when I came to her, she took off her sunglasses. She had a big black eye, and she said, "As she walked into a door, yeah," uh, mm -hmm. and she told us that her daughter died of a heroin overdose two weeks ago and she's been drinking nonstop, and knew that she had to get out of the house and get help and thought she would start with AA but instead she wound up in a church service and she stayed and she and after the service she talked to two or three women each of whom have had life experiences akin to her spousal abuse, alcoholism, a child with drug addiction. And uh, 
she was convicted and converted. Um, I didn't have a tent up, so it wasn't a tent meeting. Mm -hmm. But here we had a woman come to Jesus Christ uh, who wasn't seeking Christ but was seeking an answer. Uh, Kevin, I, you know, people say to me, why do you stick in the Episcopal Church? Why don't you just chuck it? And we're talking about somebody later in the show uh, who's faced that decision. And part of it is, is that I see the Spirit at work. Um, as I said, I'm not a charismatic, I'm not a holy roller, but I do see God working in people's lives. And until such time as God is no longer present in the ministry where I am, I don't see the need to dig up stakes and move on. Mm -hmm. so, no, I, yeah, so, you, so you, you, you have defended, my God today. <laughs> you have defended the stay position well, George. Um, before stay in prosper position. Yes. <laughs> Flourish position. Stay where there's fruit. No, I absolutely agreed. Um, we were going over the stories uh, for today's show, and we, get, we came up with three. And I just want to quickly mention the first story that came to my mind. It, we're not going to stick to it. We're not going to talk a lot about it. But because it's been an on and off topic for you know the entire type of Anglican scripted, Pope Benedict, no, not Benedict, Pope Francis, uh, just put out a tweet last week that Mary is not the co-redeemer. I thought that was interesting because it came out of nowhere. And Kevin, you know that for a co-host, you're the host, I'm a co-host. <laughs> That's the third rail of Anglican Unscripted. You touch, that, you touch Mariology at your own peril. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one of those interesting things, because uh, this falls in line with the previous pope. You know, Be Benedict. You know, clearly said that Mary was not a co-redeemer. Pope John Paul would not engage yeah, the topic. Sort of, maybe yes. Yeah. Maybe, oh, yeah. how sweet if it were true. True. Yes. He. He, uh, he was not. He was not as clear as Pope Benedict, who gave a very detailed, rational explanation, yep. rejecting this. Mm -hmm. And Francis didn't give a Benedict answer, which was laid out in propositions and why. And right. Francis talk, told some reporters, "Now nah, we're not doing that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it, it, and again, uh, there has been, Francis just has had us a genius for creating, for creating havoc. Last week, uh, the Vatican said no to gay blessings. So all this week, we've had Catholic prelates um, from the American Jesuit James Martin, who mm -hmm. is a Twitter, uh, what, what is the phrase, a, a, a social media influencer. He's the uh, very liberal on this issue. He's tweeting out their Catholic clergy groups in Germany and Austria saying we will disobey mm -hmm. the Cardinal Archbishop of uh, Archbishop uh, Cardinal Schönbrunn of Austria says that well this isn't exactly going to work so we'll basically ignore it in Austria so you've got the left tearing their hair out you even have Elton John condemning the Pope for being a homophobe now this week the crusty the crusty hyper Mary types, the farthest extreme from the James Martin and Cardinal Schoenbrunn are having epilepsy, fits over Francis knocking, well, how can you say this about the Blessed Mother? And, oh, Francis, God love you. You shouldn't have been Episcopalian. You're, you, well, maybe you, you would have been paid much more, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, we've always Still. said he want, he's an Anglican wannabe, and uh, yeah. little tweets like this just secure his future in the Anglican Church for sure. Um, it is interesting because you know this is one of those you know big topics within Roman Catholicism and parts of Anglicanism as well as to what role does Mary play. George and I are not going to discuss that on the program right now, but just to see one little tweet blow up half the Roman Catholic Church was interesting. You know, after the, the the week they had ten days ago, so just interesting. We need to talk uh, more about Fletcher. There's obviously more fallout uh, in the Jonathan Fletcher cult that we talked about last week. Um, people are having their reactions. People are. Uh, if you go to Anglican.org, you can read some of the stories. Now it's time for heads to roll, as the report called for. 
but I don't see anybody stepping down or anybody saying more that, oh, sorry, missed that one. Oh, it was throwing us right in the face, but we missed it. Jonathan Fletcher was clearly uh, a person um, with sexual perversions. And I don't know how he missed it. Uh, he should not have been the Pope of Evangelicalism in Europe and England. Oops on that one. But the report says people should be fired over this, George. Who's well, being fired? The, the two stories, the, the report uh, confirmed everything that we've been saying about Fletcher, everything that people have been saying about the malign influences of he being the evil spider in the middle of the web. Mm -hmm. who had some good qualities, but he also had some personal fetishes and theology that uh, had warped and perverted uh, the faith. But the reactions have been fantastic. And for me, I'm reminded of the story Silver Blaze, where Mr. Holmes, I, let me draw your attention to the curious incident, in the, uh, curious incident of the dog in the night. Yeah. But the dog did nothing in the night. That is the curious incident. We have had uh, conservative evangelicals who are not part of the tribe uh, respond. Melvin Tinker and, and the Anglican Futures group have responded with a forthright condemnation of this culture that allowed Flesher to flourish. We've had the Church of England Evangelical Council. We've had lots of statements, but we've had silence from the Archbishop of Canterbury. We've had silence from Nicky Gumbel. Mm -hmm. We've had silence from those people in that evangelical inner circle whom the report urged to resign. The report put out by 31.8, a, uh, a firm that works in this area, and it was a very well done, thorough job. They should be commended for their professionalism had a huge number of recommendations. So large, in fact, that I think it was a mistake because you could lose some of the recommendations with just the mass. Yeah. One of the recommendations was that there be a house cleaning of senior leadership within conservative evangelical circles and at Emanuel Church Wimbledon. Robin Weeks, the uh, incumbent of Emanuel Church Wimbledon uh, for the last 10 plus years, has said that he's not going to resign. So the report called on him to resign without naming him. William Taylor uh, at St. Helens Bishopgate, uh, sort of the successor spider in the center, is not going to resign. Our Julian Mann, who writes as a freelancer for Anglican Inc., talked to Rod Thomas, the Bishop of Maidstone, the flying bishop. And Bishop Thomas uh, gave an answer that did not do him some credit, which was, well, yes, I may be bishop, but that doesn't mean anybody tells me anything. I don't know. I have no power. I'm just a figurehead. That's not a good answer, but it was his answer. But then in the details that jo that uh, Julian Mann was able to provide, it showed that uh, Fletcher, I just want to make sure I got it right, that Thomas knew about this in 2018, uh, Fletcher's uh, perversions. But in February 2019, he was still part of groups that where Fletcher was leading and teaching young clergy, the victims, his historic victims. So if Thomas knew in 2018, but allowed Fletcher to lead groups of which he was part in 2019, what does that say about Rod Thomas? Will Rod Thomas resign for his inaction? And another thing that uh, has uh, come up is uh, the report called for Emmanuel to bring in an outsider to sort of oversee the process. Now, Kevin, when I think of an outsider within the, the conservative evangelical circles, I think of Colin Coward. I He's think outside. of Gavin Ashenden. <laughs> sure. I think of Kevin Coulson. Sure. I, think of, I think of somebody not on the team, not even sympathetic to the team, but a person of integrity who can keep them honest. Well, they did bring on an outsider. His name is Mark Maino. Now, Mark Maino uh, was educated at Eton. He went to the Ewern camps. I don't know if he went to Oxford or Cambridge, but he did go to Ridley Hall, the, uh, the evangelical conservative uh, seminary. He then had, went to Christ Church Fullwood and then on to All Souls Langham Place. 
where uh, and he's now on medical leave for depression and I gotta tell you if this is an outsider um, they may must not have a very big outside this is like he, President Biden asking Obama to oversee a commission see, yes yeah I'm, no no disrespect meant to Mark Maynard no. but that the for an for a real outsider someone like you and me across the ocean this is a farce mm -hmm. uh here is somebody who uh he's worshiping at saint mary's in uh i think maidenhead yeah. and i may be wrong and i would hope you could i hope our viewers can correct me but i'm pretty sure that saint mary's maidenhead was where the curate was fired not too long ago for preaching against Jonathan Fletcher from the pulpit there. And this is where he, the man goes in his medical convalescent leave that he he's being taken care of in a circle. I don't know if he needs to be taken care of financially, but he's certainly being taken care of spiritually and emotionally. And he's supposed to provide outside oversight? How's that going to work? I don't understand that. Well, now, I could be bla I could be blackening a good man with by my ignorance and stupidity, and I apologize if I am. But just from the outside facts, this this doesn't pass the smell test. It doesn't. And every report in history that's ever been published in a topic like this gets published, and then there's people who are mentioned in the report who all of a sudden have what I call Sergeant Schultz itis. I didn't know. I know nothing. This is this is news to me. And that's the biggest surprise in all this is all the people who said they didn't know. Or they had hints but they didn't investigate. There were warning signs, but he was the Pope. Why would we why you know, uh he certainly had minders who could have uh you know, investigated and and stopped this short. And that's the disappointing part is how many people did know. Uh, and when they knew. So, <sighs> hopefully, we can stop reporting on Jonathan Fletcher. George, uh, the other story I have uh, on my screen here is persecution during Easter. We had a bombing uh, on Palm Sunday that happened, and uh, we see this more frequently over the last 20 years uh, within churches around the world. Easter is a great time to try and smuggle. Uh, a bomb inside a church and kill Christians. And my fear is somewhere in Africa, somewhere in Indonesia, somewhere in the uh, outskirts of the Middle East, somebody's going to try and, and kill our brothers and sisters in Christ as they celebrate Easter. We had, I don't know, if, I can't remember if it was a year or two years ago, an Easter Sunday bombing at three churches in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Yeah. We had in uh, Makassar on uh, South Sulawesi, a, uh, an island with a very large Catholic population in Indonesia, uh, bombing on Palm Sunday. Uh, two people on a motorbike, they later were identified as husband and wife, tried to enter the courtyard of the church and were stopped by security guards. And just as the service was uh, emptying out from 1030, they exploded their bombs at the courtyard. They killed themselves and wounded uh, 10, 15 people. Uh, thank goodness they couldn't get inside the courtyard. Um, but this Sunday, I hate to say this, but we're going to read something about Nigeria or Pakistan mm -hmm. or Mozambique or some place. Or, and now that's the direct uh, threat of terrorism. Now this Sunday, what's church going to be like in China or in Hong Kong? or in places where the government has adopted a viciously anti-Christian mindset and worldview. Um, you know, we've been publishing stories from uh, Chinese sources, uh, Chinese religious, uh, expatriate religious websites, mm -hmm. you know, where the Ten Commandments have been replaced on the walls of churches by because the government uh, uh, believes that the greatest commandment is to follow the teachings of the, the dear leader. Uh, if you're in North Korea or Mao Zedong or uh, Chairman Xi, um, the church is under attack in a way it's never been before. It's under direct militant attack by militant Islam. 
and it's also under direct attack by governments, uh, particularly China at this time. It's a bad. It's a bad time to be a Christian in the uh, developing world. Well, we say developing world. I, you know, I want to take a, a close look at Nigeria, for example. You and I talked seven or eight years ago about the possibility of Sudan falling, and Sudan eventually split. You know, you and I both see the same type of trajectory now for Nigeria, where Nigeria has you know two warring factions over oil, money, power, religion, and what's to stop Nigeria from being uh, a north-south Nigeria in three years, two years, with a lot of blood sh shed to get there? Well, the official position of the Church of Nigeria is that they support the Federal Republic. Mm -hmm. And I think they do so because if the Nigeria were to be split up, the Christians in the north would be left unprotected. Right. They're, they're brothers and sisters in, uh, in the areas that are being pillaged and ravaged by Boko Haram, be at the mercy of an Islamic government. And in the center, we have uh, the Christians being attacked by these uh, Fulani tribesmen, herders, uh, who drive their cattle across farmlands and kill the farmers and clashes over. The farmer doesn't want his crops destroyed. And uh, the Fulani say, tough, we need to feed our cattle. And the farmers and the herdsmen all seem to have AK-47s while the farmers have shovels. Yeah. Who dies? And part of the problem is that the government of Muhammad Buhari ha is no longer even s trying to seem to be even-handed. And that it will go to the ends of the earth to track down separatists in, the, uh, in what we, we used to call the Biafra region. Uh, Igbo people trying to break free from Nigeria and kill them in skirmishes. But the army is just d looks the other way to the, mil to the Fulani and the Boko Haram. It's, and I, I don't mean to be a doom and gloom person, but Nigeria, I don't think, is long as a unified republic if the current people in power remain in power because the money and the wealth and the industry and the commerce is in the south and the oil is in the south. It's run by the people from the north, the generals in the army. And at a certain point, it's going to fall apart. And when it falls apart, it's not just going to stop between North and South. The, the Uber, Yoruba will want it, their own country, and the Igbo will want the country. Then the, Nigeria shouldn't be you know, is a country because that's what the English grabbed up. Um, it would be as if we've got a country that includes the Portuguese and the Irish and the Norwegians and the Italians and the Albanians and and squish them all together and say you're all members of the EU. Well, we see how that works. Yeah, it doesn't work at all. <laughs> yes. So uh, I, I don't mean to be negative because I understand completely the desire of the Church of Nigeria for peace and prosperity, and they've had this in the past. Yes. Uh, but with the current people in power, it does not look like things can hold together. No. Uh, another African story. Um, we heard about you know a, a future consecration of a female bishop in Kenya. Uh, the rumors have been out there that she had been elected or appointed, and there would be a consecration. But it's one of the most quiet stories that I've seen uh, out of Kenya, uh, which has you know a moderately okay press office and they have a good website to keep things updated. Um, but this week they consecrated a woman bishop, which uh, clearly violates the uh, uh, agreements made by Gafcon. Uh, and I think, you know, we have to talk about it because our audience wants to know, did it happen? Yes, it happened. Where it happened, George will give you the, the, the diocese and stuff like that. But what does this hold for the future of Kenya and the relationship with GAFCON? Uh, George, so let's talk about well, Emily. Well, Emily Oyango is a senior lecturer and professor at St. Paul's University in Limeru. She was the second woman ordained, I think a deacon, in the uh, Anglican Church of Kenya. Mm -hmm. And that was almost 40 years ago, uh, close to 40 years ago. Uh, Kenya, uh, years ago, changed its constitution to allow women to be ordained to the ministry. And I think they did it for everybody, deacons, priests, bishops. Uh, within the last, during the Gafcon era though, and women have always played historically 
a, a prominent role in the Anglican Church in East Africa. Much and of that is due to the East African Revival. Well. Yeah, and leadership where, roles. Where women have played a leadership role. Mm -hmm. GAFCON, its members, agreed to a moratorium on the consecration of women bishops because some of the members of GAFCON do not accept women bishops as uh, being... Uh, it's, it's, it's something that they have theological difficulties with. Mm -hmm. The Nigerians being an example, the Anglican Church in North America being another example. And so there was an agreed moratorium. Well, the Sudanese, South Sudanese, broke this, I think in 2017, 2018. And the new, and, and it was broken by uh, the old archbishop who was leaving and he just did it. And the new archbishop, when he came to the next GAFCON primus meeting, said, look, I'm sorry, this was done by the archbishop, wasn't I done by the it, House yeah. of Bishops. She's mm -hmm. an assistant bishop, and he gave all the reasons why they did it, but we're not going to do it again. And, you know, this would be the exception. And now I can toot our own horn. Anglican Inc. broke this story about the first uh, GAFCON woman bishop. Um, we were, because the Sudanese church did not announce this. And in fact, we were only able to prove it when we had the group photo and there is one person at the end of the line with a purse and a skirt. And a purple shirt. <laughs> and here it was. Yeah. Well, so Uganda and Kenya were both churches where women are in senior positions and are eligible and have the skills and experience to be bishops. Both churches agreed not to, by actions of their house of bishops, not to go forward. The Bishop of Bondo uh, in Kenya is a bit of an outlier. He's not part of the inner team or allies of the archbishop or the previous archbishop. There are several factions in Nigeria, um, Uganda, Kenya, and the factions break along tribal lines. And the Bishop of Bondo has been taking, took, has been taking a great deal of money from Trinity Wall Street. Um, and even though he's taken a great deal of money from Trinity Wall Street, his parish is terribly in debt. Its parish collections are a year in arrears, meaning uh, it's got a year income missing, but people haven't been paid because of the famine and it's just a miserable place economically. So here's a, here's a diocese that is dirt poor and is surviving on handouts from New York. And all of a sudden, the bishop announced he wants an assistant bishop. And he has an election with no uh, candidates but one. And it's reported it was unanimously approved that Emily Oyango be uh, elected assistant bishop of Bondo. And then members of the synod complained to the archbishop. They say it was unanimous. It wasn't. We object. And if we, we have no money at all, how are we going to pay another bishop? How are we going to buy a car for? How are we going to do all this and that? Well, the new bishop explained, well, Emily wouldn't actually be in the diocese. She'd stay at the seminary where she was a professor and draw her salary from that seminary. And her ministry would be to raise up women leaders in the seminary and come and do occasional teaching jobs in the diocese. So she actually wouldn't do anything to be a bishop. Uh, she wouldn't do any Episcopal things. Uh, she'd probably do confirmations or stuff like that, but she wouldn't actually exercise Episcopal ministry. She'd just get to wear the uniform. And this is unkind, uh, but the Bishop of Bondo uh, wants to make his mark, and I think he wants to open the spigots. Mm -hmm. And if you see the response from uh, American and uh, English uh, liberal uh, church sites. Oh, how wonderful. Uh, this is great. You know, the Holy Spirit is moving, all this and that. Perhaps, or perhaps this guy sees an opportunity to make some money. And I know that's harsh, but Kevin, you and I have been in this long enough. We've to been know. in, yeah. I mean, trajectory has so, shown. History so has Kevin, shown. Yeah. Kevin, Kevin started off this segment by mentioning this is the worst kept this is the worst publicized news we've ever seen um we got an i got you we each got an email because it was the two of us that somebody had a copy of a twitter a tweet from somebody showing a picture of the, her consecration 
I didn't know because the last thing I had heard was that the Archbishop was investigating. So I looked up the tweet, and sure enough, there she was in an Episcopal outfit. And I, then I went on to Facebook, and I found that the Anglican Church of Kenya had posted some pictures from the consecration. But there's nothing on their website. There's no official provincial announcement. And I'm getting out my magnifying glass, and I'm staring at my screen trying to identify the bishops who consecrated her. Who's missing? The archbishop. He's not there. Are there any American or Europeans? Are there any white faces in this crowd? There are none. So what does this tell me? This was done in a hurry. This was done uh, whether or not it had the approval of the archbishop doesn't seem to matter. But what it, it reminded me most of all of that story we told a few years ago about Eliud Wabakula and the Anglican Consultative Council. Yeah. The ACC was going to meet in Zambia, Lusaka, and Eliud said Kenya would not send a delegation. Eliud Wabakula was the archbishop. And then patient of country where there wasn't telephone or contact. Next thing we know, here's the delegation from Kenya in Lusaka, and here's this letter from Eliud Wabakula saying that he had given his permission he changed his mind Eliud comes back from his trip and says this is a forgery i didn't authorize this and it turns out the bishop of nairobi who was to be the episcopal delegate to acc lusaka had forged his name copy and pasted yeah. copy and pasted his name mm -hmm. and with this document he got the lay and a clergy delegates to go with him and then the ACC said, okay, we'll pay your fares. We'll buy your airplane tickets. We'll pay your hotel bills. And we'll appoint you to the ACC Standing Committee as well. And we'll even make you the Archbishop's representative to the, Ang to the Vatican uh, Synod on the Family. So all of this was based on a fraud. Now, Josiah Wadawu Faron famously accused Kevin and I of being satanic and lying and being agents of the devil for saying this. But we interviewed Eliud Wabakula, and we have the tapes, and, you know, a lie, the lie is Josiah Dawi Faron, you know, was lying. And uh, I have no problem saying that because no. I have the documentary evidence <laughs> to prove it. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, friends, this is, this is the Anglican world. I hate to say it, but there are, there are uh, wheels within wheels. And it's like a Russian, one of those nesting dolls that you take off one layer, then there's another layer, then there's another layer, and you finally get to the very bottom to find out what's really going on. So no, this is not a statement of women's rights or celebrating the ministry of women. This is a part of a power play against a weak archbishop in Kenya by his opponents to see how far they can go so that when the next election comes up, they can take power, yeah. in, no, my, I, I, in my humble opinion. In, in our humble opinion, you know, and we've seen this before. And, and you just talked about Iliad Wabakula's experience with uh, uh, a, a direct uh, bishop. Um, last story, George, we're going to talk about Bishop Love. Uh, saved him for last. Bishop Love wrote a letter uh, explaining that he's asked Michael Curry, that he no longer be clergy in the Episcopal Church, that he no longer be a bishop, he no longer be in the House of Bishops, that he's basically moving on. Okay, I'm stepping down, I'm moving on. I really. To the east side, to a deluxe yes. apartment in the sky. <laughs> I really want nothing to do with the Episcopal Church anymore. And, you know, I, I'm moving on to the, the ACNA. So, uh, not surprised by the move. Not surprised that this is happening. I'm surprised that, um, you know, we talk all the time, what what ditch do you want to die in? And I think uh, Bishop Love said, I'm going to die in this ditch uh, over these resolutions from the General, uh, Count, general Council. Um, what's it called? General, General, General. Convention? Convention. That's got to be the shot. It's affecting my memory. The general convention, uh, you know, this is just a, a step too far. And he got into the ditch to die in, and there was nobody there to help him. 
you know, the, no other conservative bishops, you know, were there to, to help rescue him, to help, help him through this. Um, no Episcopal bishops were there. The conservative faction of Episcopal bishops were not there to help. They were there to talk. You know, this is really sad what's happening to Bishop Love, and this is just a, a reminder of how bad sometimes it can be in the Episcopal Church. That's not helping. <laughs> That's not the fight Bishop Love wanted you to help join in. So now Bishop Love has to move on because there's nothing in the Episcopal Church that he finds worth uh, saving or working for. And George, I find that very sad and disheartening that nobody was there to help him. I think that's the sad part. I, I don't think there's any great shock or surprise that this uh, this uh, whole saga ended on this note. Mm -hmm. uh, Bishop Love, uh, Bishop Love today published uh, an email or letter to the members of the diocese, announcing that he had uh, requested release from his ordinate or his ordained vows, and uh, basically uh, released from the ministry of the Episcopal Church. And he said he would worship in the Anglican Church of North America. He was going to stay in his home in the Adirondacks, but would not engage in any ministry within the boundaries of the Diocese of Albany, because he didn't want to hurt or damage his old diocese. So, it, you know, technically speaking, he, uh, it's not clear whether he will accept, he take orders in the ACNA, mm -hmm. or whether he will worship in the ACNA. Um, just like John Howe uh, worshipped, you know, left the Episcopal Church and his ministry, uh, but has not, doesn't exercise. Well, he may right now, I'm not certain, so I'll, I, I should stop there. Yeah. But the whole, the whole, uh, and, well, he, he released a statement today, and the presiding bishop also released a statement, and uh, I was reminded of the walrus in Alice in Wonderland. I weep for you. I weep yeah. for you, said Michael Curry as he's eating the little oysters. Michael Curry weeps for uh, uh, Bill Love as Michael Curry is the one who forced Bill Love out. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult time, but Bishop Love is taking a principled stand both to preserve the integrity of the Diocese of Albany, mm -hmm but he's realized that he no longer is able to lead that fight, and he has to pass the baton to the next person who will work to preserve the integrity and theological, uh, the theological integrity of the Diocese of Albany and its faithfulness to uh, Scripture. Now, I am biased. Way before Anglican TV even existed, Kevin had a camera that he had borrowed and he went and filmed the consecration and live streamed the consecration of uh, Bill Luff. That was my first one I ever did. And, uh, you know, I thought this man would be able to do great things within the Episcopal Church. And this is back when before the formation of the ACNA, the, before the formation of GAFCON. He was one of the people I put hope in, along with Robert Duncan and others that there would be a, a fighting chance for the Episcopal Church. And it's disappointing for me to see that the last fighting chance is gone. Put your trust not in horses and chariots, I Kevin. I did, I did. Put your did. trust I put in my, the Lord. Put my hope in a bishop. <sighs> so, put yeah. your trust not in bishops or kings. <laughs> put your trust in the God. In God. Yeah. Now, I, I, I'm saying this for comic effect, but sure. uh, I, I really think it is true that we don't, know why things are happening this way we don't know why these tribulations are being uh forced upon the faithful i mean in many ways uh the book of jeremiah seems entirely appropriate if you're a faithful anglican at this stage why oh lord yeah. well yes i know uh we have uh, hoard ourselves after false idols yes i know we've done all that but not me but still i'm cast in the same pit as my pagan brethren <clears throat> But still, God is faithful and just, and he will provide for those who will fear him. So what does it say for, for faithful Christians? Well, I think it means soldier on. Each of us has to pick out the ditch we're going to die in. I think Bishop Love was just, I'm reading minds. This is not factual reporting. This we is mind reading. We have not talked to Bishop Love, no. So I'm reading Bill's mind here. <laughs> and I think it was quite 
just I would if I were Bishop Love, I would be disturbed by the weakness of the support I received from the other members of the communion partners bishop. Absolutely. They issued some sweetly affirming statements, but nobody stood shoulder to shoulder with him. And then Bishop Love is finding that some of the communion partners are have totally bought into the woke culture. And I found it interesting that in his farewell sermon to the diocese, Bishop Love didn't go into the evils of general convention and same-sex marriage or anything like that. That you know, Bishop Love talked about the assault on our culture of cancel culture, of critical race theory, of these things that are destroying Western civilization and the American democracy. And Bishop Love can see that he has allies on the sex issue it, within the communion partners, but then he has opponents on this issue. So the Bishop Love, who else is like me, Bishop Bill Love can say. And he looks around, and when you're an army of one, that can be disheartening. Yeah. And you die in the ditch alone, and that's sad. Okay, George. Again, we're, Ryan, we're mind reading, and we may have this, I may have this totally wrong. No, well, totally wrong. I, I think, you know, after this settles down, it'd be good to have an exit interview on Anglican TV with Bishop Love. I just want to give him some time, you know, and it's Holy Week. This is the good news part of the program. All right, George, um, no show on Friday. Good Friday. Mm -mm, no. So uh, we shall see you next week unless George just collapses from Holy Week exhaustion, which you've done like every other year for Unscripted. And I know the audience will forgive us if we don't record. But uh, until then, I want to wish the audience a very happy, blessed Easter. And I, yes, George, you want to say something quick? No, I'm just going to say that I hope our viewers bring out their seersucker coats and their now that spring is here, now that it's so very hot and I'm so very sweaty. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> I'm Kevin Coulson. <laughs> and I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 356 of Anglican. Or is it 5-5? Five, five? It's 5-5. Five, five. We'll subtract one. 355. 300? Anglican. Whoa, I didn't know we are doing 300. I, <laughs> what was it? What is it? 555? We'll do 655. That's fine. Okay. Another episode, among the many episodes of Anglican Unscripted.